Good morning. Good to be with you today. Thank you for being uh, here with us. Uh, those of you who are uh, present in person and also those of you who are online, we're, we're sad that you can't be here with us in person, but we're grateful that you're connecting with us in this way and you are with us in spirit and we appreciate it and, uh, and we miss you very much. I've been glad to hear that uh, some of you have been able to get uh, your first vaccine shots. I talked with one of our older members this week. She had gotten both of her vaccine shots. Uh, very grateful for that. Uh, we are uh, praying that a day is coming soon when everyone who cannot be with us today will be able to be with us without uh, danger, without risk, and that we'll be able to take these masks off and not have to uh, worry about them anymore. We'll hang them in our closets and go back and remember them from time to time. Uh, not terribly fondly, <laughs> maybe gratefully but maybe not fondly. And I'm glad that we're able to be uh, together today online and in person, and uh, welcome. Well, let's take a few minutes to study God's Word together this morning. We're going to look at some teachings of Jesus in what we call the Sermon on the Level Place. Your Bible might say the Sermon on the Plain. This is uh, a section of Luke chapter 6. And so as we're studying through the Gospel of Luke, we're in chapter 6 uh, today, and we'll look at this a sermon by uh, Jesus. It's a lot like his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. Some parts of it are exactly the same, but some parts are different also. So uh, maybe this is uh, a, a little different angle on the same sermon, or maybe it's a, a similar sermon given at a different time and place with just a few changes. Let's take a look uh, beginning at uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 17. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, who, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who, do, who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, 
and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. The words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Level Place. The most confrontational statement in this uh, lesson here by Jesus is in verse 46, right near the end, when he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So Jesus warns us that if we listen to him, we hear his words, but we fail to obey his teaching, we're not treating him as Lord. We're not following him if we're not obeying his teaching. And his teaching then won't do us any good. You only follow Jesus if you obey his teaching. And you only benefit from his teaching if you obey it. Jesus claims that if you follow his teaching, your life will be firmly grounded on a strong foundation so that you will be able to endure every storm that life throws your way. But if you don't follow his teaching, then your life will have no foundation to hold it strong when the storm comes. It's like that house that was built without a foundation, and when the, when the flood came, the house just collapsed under the pressure, and it's washed away. It was built on nothing that could hold it in place. So this morning, I'd like us to look at three bits of Jesus' teaching here in this lesson, the Sermon on the Level Place. And imagine the kind of foundation that his teaching might provide for our lives if we fully obey it. How would it help our lives stand stronger when the storms hit? In what ways would, be, would we be better off because we obeyed Jesus? Let's start with the blessings and woes in verses 20 to 26. With these blessings and woes, Jesus surprises us. He reverses the typical status quo. He says, the poor are blessed, but woe to the rich. Woe means trouble, distress, misfortune. And so the poor are blessed, but the rich are going to have many troubles. And he says, those who, hu are, who hunger are blessed, but woe to those who are well fed now. And those who weep are blessed, but not those who laugh now. And those who are rejected because of Jesus are blessed, but not those who find everyone speaking well of them. Well, everything's upside down here. The poor are blessed, but not the rich. 
The hungry will be filled, but the well-fed will go hungry. What is Jesus trying to say? Well, Jesus is saying that your relationship with God is more important than your situation in life. You may have plenty of food, but if you don't have God, there's going to come a time when you have nothing, when you will lose everything. But the person who has God, even if they're hungry, they can depend on God knowing that he will satisfy them. People may reject you and insult you today because you follow Jesus, and that hurts deeply, but you can rejoice and leap for joy because your reward in heaven is great. You will share in the same reward as the prophets of old. Your faithfulness to Jesus in spite of the mistreatment it brings upon you is worth the reward that God has in store for you. But woe to the person who turns away from God to gain human approval like the false prophets of Israel's history did. Because a day will come when they will face God's judgment and all the good things people said about them will bring them no benefit at all. And so which is more important in life? Having food or having God? Which is more important in life? Being rich or having God? Which is more important in life? Being happy and full of laughter or having God? If you have God, then even if today you must weep, you know that your future is bright. And one day, God is going to make everything right. And he will fill you with joy that will never end. You may weep, but you have hope. Laughter is coming. If you have God, then even if today you are hungry, you know a day is coming when God will satisfy his people forever. You will never hunger again. If you have God, then if you're poor, it's okay because you know God will provide for you. And God's kingdom belongs to you as you walk with God by faith. And you have a place in God's eternal family, and you are precious to him. And Jesus is more important to you than anything people say about you or how they treat you, because all your hope is in God and not in human approval. And you would bear any shame for Jesus, knowing that you have a great reward in heaven, just like the faithful prophets of old, who also bore shame for the Lord, but will be rewarded with eternal glory. And then, once you understand what is most important in life, then you can be content. Being poor won't bother you, because you'd rather be poor with God than rich without him. Being hungry won't discourage you because you'd rather be hungry with God than have plenty without him. You won't lose heart when you have to weep because you know it's better to weep with God than to laugh without him. Happiness without God evaporates so quickly. And when people hate you, exclude you, insult you, and reject you, because you follow Jesus, you rejoice because you have God. And God has promised his children a great reward. So the storms of poverty, hunger, grief, and rejection, when they strike the house of your life, they cannot knock it down. Because your life is founded solidly on the rock of contentment. Contentment in the Lord as you obey his teaching and nothing can take away your hope in Jesus. You will survive every storm. Let's look at Jesus' teaching about loving your enemies. Verses 27 to 36. Jesus gives us a whole series of commands here about how we should treat people who do evil to us. Verse 27, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Verse 28, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Verse 29, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, give them your shirt as well. Verse 30, if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. 
verse 31. This is the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Verses 32 to 34. Love people who don't love you. Do good to people who don't do good to you. Lend to people who will not repay you. Verse 35. Love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. In verse 36. Be merciful. Be merciful. <clears throat> Jesus is teaching us with these commands to set aside our anger when people treat us badly, to set aside the offense, set aside the dishonor that they've done to us, set aside our fear, be merciful to them in ways that they do not deserve. Bless them. Pray for them. Love them. Be generous to them. Do people who hate us and treat us badly deserve such kindness? Well, of course they don't. It seems ridiculous, in fact, to follow this command of Jesus because it seems to reward bad behavior. But Jesus says, and this is where these commands stab deep into our hearts, Jesus says we do this because this is how God treats people, including his enemies. Verse 35, God himself is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. And that's us, or was us, before we came to Jesus. We were sinners. We had offended God. We were enemies of God. But God loved us, and he had mercy on us, and he treated us better than we deserved. And he gave us Jesus, and through Jesus, he gave us a new life. And part of this new life is that now we don't treat people as they deserve anymore because God didn't treat us as we deserved. He loved us in spite of ourselves and his love transformed our lives. And so when you obey this teaching of Jesus and you love your enemy and you pray for the person who hurt you and you do good to people who don't deserve it, and, and I'm not saying that you should stay in a bad situation where you could be hurt repeatedly. Not at all. But you can still pray for that person who hurt you. But when you do these things, you may or may not change the life of the other person. Maybe your unexpected love for them will catch their attention and transform their heart. That's what we hope for. But whether it does or not, you will be merciful just as your Father is merciful. You will be children of the Most High, doing what our Heavenly Father does, showing our love to others as He shows His love, doing for them what we would want them to do for us instead of what they deserve, showing mercy to them as God has shown mercy to us. And when we do that, when we obey these commands of Jesus, our relationships with other people get better. We become people of peace in a contentious world. We become people others can trust. We become people who help others and do not harm others. We become children of God. And the storms of life, however hard they blow, cannot dislodge our love for people and for God because we've built our lives on the love that God has for us, which we now also show to others. This is what Jesus is teaching us to do. And let's take a look at Jesus' teaching about judging, verses 37 to 45. Clearly, there's a time for judging because Jesus, in verses 43 to 45, compares people to fruit trees and says, you can tell the quality of a tree by its fruit, and people are the same way. A good person bears good fruit in their life, and a bad person bears bad fruit in their life through the things they do and through the words that come out of their mouth because the mouth speaks what is in the heart. And so you can, and we do, judge a person by their words and their deeds, and you can see whether or not they have a good heart. But when Jesus says, do not judge, he's warning us not to be judgmental, not to be critical of others. There's a time for judging, but don't judge lightly. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. 
Jesus says in verse 37. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Instead, forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So the way you judge and critique others is the way that God judges and critiques you. But if you forgive others, God will forgive you. And if you give to others, God will give to you. And generously, he will be like the generous merchant in the marketplace selling you grain. You buy a gallon of grain, and this merchant, he doesn't you know, kind of fill your jug and then give it back to you nine-tenths full and say, well, that's good enough. No, he fills it to the top. And he presses it down, fills in a little more, shakes it all together to make a little more room, fills it up a little more, shakes it again, fills it up all the way to the top, and then overflowing, and only then does he give it back to you. And that is how God is with us. He pours out his generosity on us when he sees that we are generous toward others. And he pours out his generosity not just with money or things, but also with forgiveness. When we forgive others, God also forgives us generously. But if we are critical of others, then how should God treat us then? And so Jesus warns us not to try to take the speck of sawdust out of our brother's eye while we still have a plank in our own eye. His lesson here is that we need to deal with our own sins and our own problems first before we start judging people for their problems and their sins. Only when we've turned away from our own sins can we help people turn away from theirs. So Jesus gives us two sets of instructions here. First, be gentle and generous in how you judge other people. Be slow to judge, quick to forgive. Because the way you treat others is the way that God will treat you. Be slow to condemn and quick to give, and God also will give to you. This makes our relationships with everyone better. It helps us become people who are kind, who are thoughtful, people who think about what another person needs before we criticize, people who give grace. Second, Take care of your own problems before you jump out and try to fix other people's problems. It's so easy to be more critical of others than we are of ourselves. A lot of relationships, a lot of marriages break down because one party sees all the faults in the other but never sees their own faults. But if we can take an honest look at ourselves and work with God to address the sin in our own lives, then we will have the credibility to help others with their sin. And we'll have more grace for them because we know how hard it was to deal with our own sin. This makes our relationships with other people better too. It fills us with wisdom and grace. And grace is like oil that lubricates the gears that otherwise would grind together. But the oil lets them slip beside each other smoothly, seamlessly, so that they can work together without getting stuck or breaking down. Grace is like oil that lubricates the gears of our relationships. So Jesus, in this teaching about judging and forgiving, gives us a solid foundation for building relationships with people and with God, a foundation that will stand strong in every storm, building relationships based on grace, not a judgmental attitude, relationships filled not with hypocrisy or criticism, but with forgiveness and generosity. And when we treat others with forgiveness and generosity, God pours out his forgiveness and generosity on us. So imagine what it would be like if we obeyed Jesus' teachings here in the sermon on the level place. We would be more content. And when the storms of poverty, hunger, grief, or rejection hit our lives, our lives would stand firm because our hope is in God and we could be content. Our relationships with other people would be healthier as we follow Jesus' teaching because we would treat other people not as they deserve but with mercy, the way we want to be treated, the way God has treated us. Our relationship with God would be healthier 
as we refuse to be judgmental toward others, as we forgive them and give generously to help someone, God does the same for us. We would truly be children of our good Father. And our whole lives would be stronger for it, able to withstand any storm by the strength that God provides as we obey the commands of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus always make our lives better. Not easier necessarily. A lot of what he teaches here is very hard. But it makes our lives better. They make us better people and they bring us closer to God. If you believe this is true, then go out this week and put into practice something that Jesus taught us in the sermon on the level place. Be content as you walk with God. Love your enemies and show mercy to those who don't deserve it. Don't judge, but forgive. And when the storm comes, you will stand strong because in obedience to God, you have put the teachings of Jesus into practice. May God strengthen you this week. May he bless you that you may follow the teachings of Jesus. Let's pray together. God, our Father, thank you for the words of Jesus to guide us and to help us. Thank you for caring so much about us that you've given us this good teaching to help us build on a solid foundation that our lives may grow strong and able to withstand every storm. Lord, we pray that you would bless uh, our relationship with you, that we may always seek you first in our lives and find contentment in you in every situation. We pray, dear Lord, that you would bless our relationships with others, that as we um, interact with people from day to day and as people uh, do us harm or they frighten us or they oppose us, that we may respond to them in the way that Jesus would. Lord, teach us to love our enemies well. Teach us, Lord, to, uh, to care about uh, those who do not care about us. And hear our prayers for them, Lord, when we pray to you. Lord, help us not to judge not to condemn, not to be critical people, but help us, Lord, to be forgiving and gracious as you are to us. Help us to see good and evil for what they are, but help us to also love people as you love people. Lord, make our lives stronger day by day. Help us to grow in you. Help us to grow in obedience to the commands of Jesus. Lord, help us to obey Jesus, our Lord. For we know your love for us that has brought us these commands. We know your love for us that gave us Jesus, who gave his life for us on the cross. Thank you for the forgiveness that he brings us. Thank you for the hope that we have, uh, the hope of eternal life, because you raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Thank you so much, dear God. Lord, bless your church today. In Jesus' name, amen.